importance of getting age appropriate curriculum into the classrooms about co-parenting in classes where family dynamics are taught and uh, mental uh, mental illness, mental health disorders are taught. So we covered a lot, you know, and there's a lot more that we could have covered. But yeah, it was it was really really great. So I'm looking forward to doing more of those presentations in schools, and I've I've got some more coming up real soon. So that's what I've been up to. So what about you? What have you been up to? Because you've been you've been busy too, and you and I we usually like touch base you know, a couple times yeah. a week. And we've just, we really haven't even been able to do that. It's been a whirlwind. It's absolutely been a whirlwind. I, I did want to comment on, on what you were up to. A lot of times it is difficult to get into the schools if you are not, don't come from, a, uh, a, from a, an objective perspective that's actually solution-based because uh, a lot of times you've, you've got parents, they that is their breeding ground, their feeding ground for, for their alienation. So the last thing they want is somebody to come in stirring things up. Mm -hmm. uh, so I can imagine that it's not necessarily always welcome for, for a person, an advocate to come in and talk about parental alienation. Well, um, I, I really went in with a very, it, it's a professional presentation. So I'm not going in as um, an upset parent or even necessarily as an advocate, although I am an advocate, but I'm going in as an educator and a trainer. So I'm going into these schools with a professional presentation that has got educational content, and uh, it goes it goes through the school. You know, all schools have got training, um, and they do workshops. And so when I go in, it's really a training and a workshop. So it, it's it, it, it like I said, it's not. I don't go in as a parent. Um, or an advocate, of course I am advocating, but I go in to do a professional training and workshop for the schools to teach them uh, about a subject that they need to know about and to teach them skills and to give them some calls to action. Absolutely. And, and, and that, that's always been my, my approach as well, is when I talk to people, it's, it's providing solutions for a, a problem that, they, that already exists. And you yes. know educators they they're it's as a former elementary school teacher you, you have your heart attached to these kids and you want what's best for these kids and a lot of times when when the parents come in and they bring their battle into the classroom and they 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 pull at your heartstrings and and really you look at the parents and you just sort of like it, you it's whoever is the most enrolling in their story that sometimes you want to, you want to side with, but, um, and if you don't have the tools of being objective and, and being fair, a lot of times I could, uh, it would be easy to just be persuaded to be, uh, an accomplice to the alienation. Absolutely. And that is a big part of the presentation and the workshop that I give is to to say, you know, here are the signs and to look at these signs objectively. And then if you see these signs, then what do you do? And uh, it comes down to really, um, in a nutshell, treating both parents equally, treating both parents with equal respect and having school be a, a neutral zone where the students can receive the love and support of both parents unless legal documentation in, indicates otherwise. And that's what we need to educate uh, educators about is that, you know, when in doubt, when in question, we rely on legal documentation, not what one parent tells us about the other parent and not what the child directs us to do or tells us about the parent because we don't let kids drive that bus, right? We follow the legal documentation when there is a doubt or a question. Yeah, I think that really establishing those boundaries and those structures give give the educators the, the um, exactly what they know they know they need, they know they need to do. Like for instance, you know, just when a lot of times parent or teachers will send a note home with the child they put it in their agenda they put it in their backpack so they assume they've done their job and what they don't get is that a 
a child who comes from divorce or separation, a child does not have one home. They have two homes. Mm -hmm. They may sleep at one home more than they do the other, but it is so important that you communicate equally and fairly with both parents as if, you know, and that child, um, you know, that child has two homes. Absolutely. Schools need to, 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 make it possible or to make it really standard that they've got the capability to send all information to two households. Yep. Yeah. I agree. So, so what have you been up to? What about you? What I've been doing? Well, I guess most recently I've been in a conversation. I have a friend of mine who lives in South Florida who's been, um, and she's an, just an amazing powerhouse uh, in finding inspiring projects and just in, in connecting people. So she's a connector, a world connector. She's from Israel and she found a couple of people who were working on a project in Israel uh, around um, providing support for children, adolescents, and maybe young people who are experiencing their parents' divorce or their parents' separation. And culturally, a lot of these people uh, in that region, they, this is kind of sort of a new thing. I wouldn't, I wouldn't say it's a new thing, but uh, a lot of times culturally people will stay together. Uh, and so the society, their society hasn't had to deal with situations with divorce and bl blended family uh, situations like here in the United States most of the states require that you have to take our, the, the family stabilization course if you're going through divorce or separation through the courts. Uh, but over in Israel, there is no requirement for that, uh, for parents to have, you know, be educated and get support on how to co-parent um, in the, the most healthy way. So we were just doing some brainstorming and, um, and just putting our heads together and, and something that's kind of developing is possibly like chat rooms that, um, that are managed by educated certified moderators uh, in not only chat rooms for the parent, but also the, the, the child, the adolescent, uh, like separate chat rooms and, and all that that are um, managed by, uh, by moderators. So, we're, we're putting that together and also uh, considering the language barrier. So there would be groups that we're grouping together based upon the language that they speak. And that means they're not limited to the country or the region or a local physical support group. They could actually be in communication. Somebody from Israel could be in communication with somebody in America in this same group. So, and, um, and then there's a, a curriculum that's being established. Uh, so that in these groups, the the parent will actually learn some strategies and on how to better, more powerfully be a co-parent, uh, and of course strategies for the adolescent as well. So that's kind of that's something in the works. So there I'm, would be, um, so there would be facilitators for these different chat groups, and they would all go by. Uh, they would have a training that's all the same. Is that what you're saying before they yep. facilitate these groups? They would, they would need to have certain qualifications, certain educational background and experience first, and then they would be trained through, uh, to go through our curriculum so that, um, so that, you know, they can most effectively help these people, these people going through this conflict because as you know, even in the courtroom, you've got these experts who are family law attorneys who've mm -hmm. gone through all the education and you've got mental health counselors and judges. And even as educated as they are in the field, they all have, um, we find a lot of flaws in that. So yes. um, mostly, you know, educating them on what's the, um, on these moderators on what it is that we're all about, which is that children should have a loving relationship with both parents. And there's certain things that are important for, for a parent to do to facilitate that relationship. I think that's awesome. And, and I think 
it really illustrates that this is a, a worldwide problem. You know, this is a global epidemic. It, it doesn't, it's not specific to any certain area or region. And so I think that's really, really awesome. Yeah, and well, we know that because during the month of April, Parental Alienation Awareness Month, uh, a lot of times we get reached out to by um, all the people that are that are creating their bubbles of love events throughout the planet and so it's definitely a global conversation definitely well i i don't think connie's gonna be making it i don't well, maybe so. um let's talk about who we're gonna have next week okay i'm i'm really really excited about next week so next tuesday night at same same time, same place, same time, 6.30 Central. Um, our guest is going to be Crystal Shivers, and she has a Facebook page called Kid of PAS, and I've been connected with her for quite a few years. So she uh, was an alienated child. She was alienated from her dad for 17 years. Wow. So for most of her life, and she is, I believe she's in her early 30s now, so she um, has a relationship now with her dad. They did reconnect after 17 years when she was an adult. Uh, so I'm really, really excited that she's going to be joining us and, and sharing her story from the perspective of uh, a child of parental alienation. You know, that's when we, we were having a conversation a few weeks ago with, with Ginger Gentile about, uh, with her documentary, and she's now on uh, trying to get interviews of, of adult children of parental alienation. Uh, so it's a, and, and some of the conversation is a lot of times they deal with loyalty conflicts and they had been so aligned with a parent. They don't, they, they love that parent. So it's, it, it really takes something for them to, to, to speak out. And a lot of times it takes them till they're in their mid twenties or pushing thirties before they have the courage to, to speak out without feeling like they're betraying a parent. Yeah. It's very, very courageous of them. This is really sad, but you know, I get contacted um, pretty regularly by um, adults who were alienated kids and they're still trying to manage having a relationship with both parents and I've had several of them tell me I want to tell my story but I'm waiting until the alienating parent dies it's so sad wow. I, I mean but they really are they want to speak out about it they want to share their story they want to help other people but they still are in that loyalty bind and they're, they're afraid to speak out because there could be repercussions from the alienating parents. So uh, some of them, it's very, very sad, but they're really waiting for that moment when they feel free to speak about it. It's very, very sad. That is sad. I, I, um, and the, you know, the goal is to eliminate the alienation altogether, you know, um, the, and there's, there are people around that I think through this work, uh, getting the support of, of, um, the different professionals that are involved in these high conflict families it, by getting them to, to be a stand for, um, you know, the right thing that children should have a loving relationship with both parents. Sometimes that can diffuse or derail an alienator's attempts to, so that they, sometimes they just like, you know, they, they let it go. You know, they let it, let go of their fight, or at least they realize it, that, um, that it's not going to work. But, um, Anyways, I we I guess we got to go. It is not. It is six after the hour, and um, I've had a great conversation with you. I know it was nice. We got to catch <laughs> up, and I think it's good that we got to share with everybody what we've been up to. So yeah, but I'm sorry that Connie missed it. But we we will reschedule. We will have her on again because she's going to be a really great guest. She's doing a lot of important work. That's great. Yeah. All right. Well, have a wonderful week. And uh, we'll see you again on Tuesday. Okay. Okay. All righty. 
It's good well, to talk to you. And yeah, um, good to talk to you. <laughs> <laughs> we'll do it again. Oh, um, yeah, we're getting some people. I'm excited yeah. about it. Yeah, it's going to be good. I sent out a lot of invitations today, and I've been meaning to do that, and I just finally had a chance to. So, good. Yeah, that'll be good. I've um.